Are budget groove boxes like the Innovation Circuit, the Roland MC-101, or the Korg Electribe 2 just toys? In my opinion, the answer is no, and I've got some concrete reasons why I think that's the case, and I'm also going to play some audio examples a little later on, but be aware that this is going to be a fairly talky video. The big thing that I really want you to take away from this video is that if a device can slot at least somewhat seamlessly into someone's process for making and finishing a proper song, then it should not be considered a toy and should be considered a legitimate audio tool. And beyond that, devices like this give you a lot more features and uh, ability to fine tune your sound than I think a lot of people realize. And I want to get into all that. So first of all, let's talk about these getting worked into the process for creating and finishing a proper song. And when I say proper, I mean something that you would like put on an album that could land itself on Spotify playlists or get dropped live. Uh, something that has a decent amount of polish to it and meets a pro standard of quality. And of course, there's some variation there, but I'll get to that in a second. All three of these give you the ability to do that in some way without any terribly convoluted workarounds. The Roland MC-101 has the best version of this because it's got the multi-track audio over USB export, so you can record the four stereo tracks individually while jamming live and then fine tune them in your DAW. That's fantastic and I would love to see that implemented in other devices in this price range. The Electribe can export individual wave files, although it's not live, but once again you can fine tune those. And then the Circuit can do multi-track MIDI, so if you're not a fan of the internal sounds and like using it as a sketch pad, just quickly record the MIDI into your DAW, maybe even jam that out live as well, load up some of your favorite synth plugins and sampler plugins, and pretty quickly you've got a track, and that can be even faster if you set up templates in your DAW. All three of these devices also have the ability to sequence external gear, and this is something that we're seeing more and more in cheaper and cheaper devices, which is really fantastic to see. And you can have a fairly inexpensive device be the brain of an entire larger setup. The Circuit Tracks is kind of the next evolution of that, where uh, it also acts as the mixer for a track, so it kind of assimilates external synths into itself, which is really fun to work with and makes for a really kind of seamless workflow. And this is indicative of a larger trend. These devices are getting good and are increasingly getting more and more kind of pro features at an affordable price, which is really cool to see and are staying very compact in the process. And that's the thing. I have seen some comments floating around asking essentially, why would you pay more for less? Like you can do all this and a ton more in a DAW with more layers, more uh, flexibility, more fine tuning. But I think that misses the point. You're not paying extra for features. You're paying extra for kind of the hands-on tactile workflow paired with extreme portability and uh, almost kind of minimalism. Like just making a track entirely on one of these devices is a bit of a challenge and it's an exercise in using the most compact setup possible. It's easy to travel with, uh, whether you're setting up in a cafe or you're outdoors or you're on the road. Grabbing something like this out of your backpack and needing nothing else is really, really cool. Not everyone's going to want that, but uh, for those of us who do, having a device with such a small footprint that can be run off of batteries and actually get you some pro results if you're willing to put in a bit of time, that is incredibly cool to have and is something I'm really happy to see proliferating. Like it used to be the case that only something like the OP1 could get you that experience and now you're seeing it in much more budget form. So that's why you would pay more for less, but also I don't think you're getting as much less as you might think. Like I said, these are getting more and more pro audio features as time goes on. And even the Electribe, which is definitely the oldest and kind of jankiest of the three, has a lot more features packed into it than a lot of people realize. For instance, all three of these, as I mentioned, can sequence external gear. They can adjust or fine tune sounds to varying degrees. The circuit probably has the least in it that it only has macros. The MC-101 has a bit more in that you can tweak a lot more parameters with a little bit of menu diving. And then the Electribe has a full-on uh, subtractive synthesis engine, which I would say is kind of the minimum 
minimum viable subtractive synthesis engine. And it's got, you know, multiple filters and an LFO and all that kind of stuff. And it's very assignable to parameters. And that's great to have in a completely self-contained device. These all have the ability to have rhythms off the grid. These you can just record into unquantized. And this one, you can kind of slide tracks around a bit to get some kind of more wonky timings. You can, of course, do live jamming on these. And you can dial in a mix with volume, panning, EQ, and effects. Some people, when just looking at these, will assume that there's not a lot hiding under the toy-like appearance, but everything that I just listed is kind of everything you need to make a song. The only question then is, uh, how does that actually sound? And this is another place where people do get stopped in their tracks a bit, and that's the sound quality, which is an understandable gripe. You know, this synth is fairly old and uh, is a little bit lo-fi in nature, not really in terms of it like being digital versus analog, just kind of its aesthetic is a little more on the lo-fi side. And of course the Circuit Nova engine hasn't changed in a very long time. And also, you're usually just recording the stereo output of one of these if you're just doing a jam for YouTube. And so people typically hear these in a context where it's a bit of a rough mix and you're just using the built-in effects and potentially limited layers. And so honestly, it's understandable to me why people think that they can sound a little cheap. Uh, for me personally, you know, I've made albums worth of music on all three of these devices and I am the first to admit that not all of them quite get up to a professional standard of quality if you're taking it as a song in isolation. Like, I try to get it close, and I think I've succeeded in getting it close and even getting over that bar in some cases, especially when I can mix stuff in post, but if I'm just jamming and recording the stereo output, it doesn't always quite get there. Of course, what's missing from that is the context. I'm making a YouTube video as well as a song. Like you've got the visual component of jamming something out on one of these live and the kind of implicit understanding from the audience that um, I'm deliberately working within uh, constraints to try to make something cool out of that. You know, I really want to try to push the groove box niche on YouTube forward as much as possible and make cool stuff within that. And even with all of that kind of disclaimering out of the way, I've happily put songs from all three of these on albums that I will say, this represents me and the kind of music that I make. And some of that also comes down to genre. Different genres have different aesthetics associated with them and different kind of levels of polish that you would expect to get out of them. If I want to make super shiny modern EDM or hip hop, I'm gonna go for the MC 101 because of the ability to mix the tracks in post, but this can get close-ish and this is better for more kind of like house and maybe even a bit of lo-fi hip-hop. Once again, something with a bit more of an old school aesthetic. And using these for Synthwave, of course, is a home run. Synthwave definitely has a range of audio quality associated with the genre, and some of it can get a little more grungy and a little more kind of analog, or at least a little rough around the edges, and people roll with that. And then, of course, for hardware jams, that's always had the aesthetic of being rough around the edges. But once again, these devices don't have to sound rough around the edges if you're willing to work with a hybrid workflow with them and a DAW. So you make a song just on the go, wherever, on a super portable device that you didn't have to pay a lot for, and then you bring that into your DAW later. So. All that being said, here are a few quick audio examples of songs I've made using these devices, and I'll put a little indicator as to whether it's been mixed in post, although they've all been mastered in a DAW. And once again, I'm not trying to set myself up like I'm the best ever and these hit a perfect standard of professional quality, but this should hopefully give you at least an idea of what's possible. <laughs>
This, of course, is not the ceiling for Groove Boxes. As you go up in price, you get more and more features and more and more ability to fine tune stuff directly on the unit and in post. And I've even seen a few comments saying that people should just ignore the modern stuff altogether and go for older school stuff. I would say the problem with that is that sometimes you lose more modern features like built-in sidechain compression or the ability to smoothly interface with the DAW, but of course, to each their own. If you're still not convinced after all of this, let's say that I just grant you, yeah, they're toys meant for beginners and hobbyists, and that's fine. Uh, a lot of us got into making music for the fun and for the love of it. And so going with something that we find fun and inspiring is not necessarily a bad thing. And if you can find a setup that works with the way that you like to work and fits within your budget, I would say go for it, commit to it, and just don't let anyone gatekeep that. Keep using it, keep making music. And to people tempted to gatekeep, uh, remember, not everyone can spring for more expensive gear, and not everyone wants to be confined to a DAW. As fantastic as DAWs are, it can be nice to get away from them a bit for something a little more portable and a little more hands-on. I'm going to end this with a deliberate misquote from Derek Sivers. Are you happy? Are your listeners happy? Are you finishing songs? Isn't that enough? If you'd like to check out some related videos on how the challenge of working with self-contained portable devices has really improved my skills as a music producer, you can click or tap up over here. And if you'd like to see a video about how to get more out of a budget device, you can click or tap down over here. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll be back with a new video in a little bit.